In today's Back to Basics video, we're going to talk about Zener diodes. And we'll talk about the basics of uh, their characteristics, some of the uses of Zener diodes, and also talk a little bit about uh, some of the easy design calculations to employ a Zener diode in your design. Uh, in the second half of the video, we'll talk a little bit about why all Zener diodes are not created equal. So let's get started. Now most of you are likely familiar with the IV, or voltage and current characteristics, of an ordinary signal diode or rectifier diode, where it, as you forward bias it, it begins to conduct and essentially allows current to pass. But when you reverse bias it, very little current flows. And that's uh, how you know, most signal and rectifier diodes behave. Zener diodes are designed to break down in the reverse direction and also start conducting then in the reverse direction at some pre-described Zener voltage. And this can have some useful properties. Uh, it can be used as a shunt regulator, like a little voltage regulator. And this is typically where you don't need any particularly good efficiency because you're going to have to burn some current flowing through that diode at all times in order to maintain that Zener voltage. So it's not a very efficient regulator, but it's a very simple one. Also, sometimes in a circuit you might need a pre-described reference voltage, or a voltage that stays stable even if the power supply varies. It might be used as a reference for other parts of a circuit. So a reference voltage generator is another reason maybe to use a Zener diode. Maybe a voltage clamp or level shifting circuit, other applications like that. Uh, typical Zener diodes have got a Zener voltage ranging from about, uh, say, 2.5, you know, 2 2.4 volts to even 200 volts or more, depending on uh, you know, the, the particular diode that you have. So lots of little applications, and basically, like I said, it's just a diode that's designed to break down at a particular voltage in reverse bias. So let's go, go take a look at uh, how we would design something like this into a circuit. Each Zener diode is going to be uh, specified to operate at a particular Zener current or reverse current through the Zener diode, and that's where the Zener voltage is specified to operate. So uh, you're going to have to essentially pick a resistor value that uh, when the circuit is powered up through whatever the po positive supply is, that you're going to establish that Zener current through the diode. And you have to take into consideration that Whatever circuit you're using uh, beyond that, whether it's a reference voltage or using this as a voltage regulator, you got to figure out how much current is going to be drawn by that circuit and take that into account when you design uh, that resistor value. And the equation is actually pretty simple. Uh, we know that the voltage across this resistor is going to simply be our supply voltage, our nominal supply voltage, minus the Zener voltage. Okay. And you also then know that the current through this resistor is going to equal the sum of the Zener current, which is going to be some desired value that you get from the data sheet, plus your maximum expected load current. So the simple Ohm's law tells us what that resistor is. So it was a pretty simple uh, calculation to design you know, the series resistor to be used uh, to employ a Zener diode as a shunt regulator or, say, a voltage reference. Now to demonstrate the operation of a Zener, I've got this very simple test circuit put together. A variable DC power supply connected through an ammeter so we can measure the current going through the uh, bias resistor, in this case 330 ohms, and my Zener diode. Now I've got two voltmeters hooked up here, one voltmeter that is hooked up directly across the Zener, so we can see what that reverse voltage looks like across the Zener. And I'm calling it reverse voltage because I've got the cathode here and the anode here, so from the diode's perspective, it's reverse bias. So we'll measure that Zener voltage, or the reverse bias voltage, with one, ammi one voltmeter, and then measure the total voltage applied with the other voltmeter. And what we expect to see is as we start cranking the voltage up, at low voltages, these two voltages will match, because there'll be very little current flowing through the diode, because we're still in that condition where it's blocking. So no current flowing through the resistor, and we're going to virtually measure the same voltage on either side of the resistor. Once that diode turns on, as we bring that voltage up, we'll see this voltage start to uh, stabilize, and the voltage across uh, the 330 will increase as we increase our variable DC supply. And that indicates essentially that clamping condition where we cross that knee in the IV characteristic, and this is now just going to behave like a short circuit with a fixed voltage drop. So let's go take a look at that. So here's the test circuit on the breadboard. Uh, the two connections up here are to the DC power supply that's coming through the ammeter and also a connection up to the top voltmeter. And now uh, this is my 330 ohm resistor connected through the Zener diode. Notice the band is at the top here 
which is the cathode, so I'm going to reverse bias this diode with a positive supply applied here. And then this is going off to the other voltmeter that's reading the Zener voltage. And then uh, my uh, return or ground connection here. Okay, here's the instrumentation. This is my variable DC power supply. Uh, the voltage on the Keithley multimeter here is going to measure the voltage across the Zener diode itself. This is going to measure the current uh, that's going through the Zener diode. And then the voltmeter down here is measuring the total voltage appearing across the series combination of the 330 ohm resistor and the Zener diode. Okay, so if I turn the power supply up a little bit, let's say you go to about, say, 2 volts, uh, I can see I've got 2 volts being applied uh, across the 330 ohm resistor uh, and Zener diode combination. That same voltage is appearing across just the Zener diode. We can see I've only got uh, about 1 microamp or so of current flowing. So we're, we're in this region right here on the curve where we've got some reverse bias, but we're really not conducting yet. If I turn the voltage up a little bit more, let's say from 2 volts to now, say, 4 volts, at 4 volts now, uh, I've got about uh, th uh, 0.3 milliamps flowing. Okay, so we're starting to walk our way down this portion of the curve here on the Zener curve. Uh, we're starting to get a, a bit more reverse bias current. And we can see that because now there's a, a, a little bit larger voltage difference between the voltage applied and the voltage just across the Zener. Let's go from 4 volts to 5. So now I made just a 1 volt change from 4 volts to 5 volts applied. Only 4.4 volts is appearing across the Zener, and I've got 1.8 milliamps of current flowing. So I'm walking my way down this curve just a little bit further. Let's go from 5 volts all the way to 10 volts. Okay, so now 10 volts applied, 9.96, uh, we can see here. The voltage across the Zener has changed very little. It's now at 4.69, so about 4.7 volts, which is about right because this is a 4.7 volt Zener. And we just walked our way a little bit further down this curve and closer to the rated Zener current. Uh, and that's why we're getting the Zener voltage that we expect from this diode. So it's really uh, just about as simple as that. Uh, by reverse biasing a Zener uh, diode and limiting the current to within some operating range, you can essentially establish a relatively constant voltage to be used as a, uh, a constant voltage source for a reference voltage, voltage regulator, etc. Now remember I mentioned at the beginning that not all Zener diodes are created equal. Let's take a look at what I mean by that. Now to take a look at what I mean by not created equal, we've got to look at a little bit of the physics, but don't worry, we're not going to go too deep. Uh, Zener diodes, like any other diode, are made by uh, putting together two uh, semiconductor materials, a p-type and an n-type material. In the case of zeners, the p and n materials are very heavily doped, meaning they've got a lot of carriers, free carriers. Now when you reverse bias them, a depletion region forms, but because the uh, regions are very heavily doped, the depletion region is very thin. Uh, so the uh, electric field that appears across that uh, can be is really, really strong. It's a, a large voltage potential over, over a very thin uh, area. And that electric field uh, causes carriers to essentially tunnel through that depletion region uh, in a mechanism called quantum tunneling. We've also seen it uh, referred to as quantum mechanical tunneling. And these are true Zener diodes. This is the Zener effect and what leads to this, uh, this operation. Now Zener diodes that uh, have got Zener voltages up to about 5 or 6 volts work predominantly under this behavior. Now, one of the downsides to this is that it's not a very sharp behavior. And what I mean by that is, as you reverse bias, as you saw when we were doing our experiment, uh, the current started to come down and there was a bit of a knee. It had to roll down before you were in that reverse bias region where you, you looked like a very low resistance. There's that very soft Zener turn-on characteristic. And that's very characteristic of this Zener effect. Now, by contrast, Zener diodes whose uh, Zener voltage is, you know, greater than 5 or 6 volts uh, actually operate under a different principle. Actually, they're more accurately called avalanche diodes. In these diodes, the P and N junctions are very lightly doped, so that now when you apply that reverse bias, the depletion region actually gets uh, quite wide. Uh, and because of that, you get a voltage, again, you get that electric field that appears across that, uh, but because that is a, a relatively long distance, the electric field will cause some small amount of leakage current, just like it does in the other, t in the other case. But in this case, because that, uh, those carriers that are in this depletion region 
are exposed to this electric field for a long time, they accelerate to very, very rapid, very, very fast velocities. And they go so fast that they can smash into other atoms and free electrons from those atoms. Those electrons get also acceler accelerated by the electric field and smash into more atoms. And you get this avalanche effect that can cause a small amount of uh, uh, carriers being emitted from one side to result in a very large total amount of current that's coming through. So you get this impact ionization type mechanism, uh, kind of like a, an avalanche of snow down the side of a mountain. It's the same type of an effect. Now the uh, one advantage, if you will, to this type of operation is that this uh, characteristic of the reverse turn-on is actually uh, very sharp. Uh, and you know, We'll actually go take a look at this on the curve tracer. Uh, as you uh, bring the bias voltage it's more and more negative, you reach a point where you turn a corner, it's almost like a very sharp corner, and boom, you're conducting. You don't have that soft transition region like you do in the true zeners. So the reality is, is that uh, zener diodes, even though they're all called zeners, most of them that are above 5 or 6 volts are actually avalanche diodes. And even uh, most, most of the zeners actually will have some of these two different properties operating at the same time. Uh, so you'll get some avalanche effect and some zener effect. It's just that those that are rated at higher voltages will be more avalanche than zener, and those that are rated at uh, lower voltages will be more zener than avalanche. Let's go take a look at the two on the curve tracer so you can see what we're talking about. Now the curve tracer is going to allow us to essentially draw that same curve that you saw written on my note paper. Uh, the horizontal axis here is, in this case, set up to 1 volt per division, and the vertical axis is set up to 2 milliamps per division. Uh, so if I, I've got a simple ordinary diode in here right now, and if I turn the voltage up, we can see the typical ordinary diode characteristic, uh, where we're uh, forward bias a little bit, and we get that uh, strong forward current, but in reverse bias, we essentially block and have no current flowing at all. We're sitting essentially at zero, which is the middle of the, of the plot. And that's your typical, ordinary uh, silicon diode characteristic. Let's take a look at a Zener diode and an avalanche diode. Okay, so this is that same uh, 4.7 volt Zener that we had in our test circuit. We turn the voltage up on here. We can see we're starting off by looking at like an ordinary diode. But as I continue to increase the voltage, now I start to see me walking down and uh, doing that Zener breakdown over here. And here you can see what I was talking about where we've got a relatively soft turn on characteristic. So if you don't reverse bias it with enough current, you can be on this kind of higher resistance portion of the curve, and it won't be as stiff or as stable of a voltage reference as it is when you get further down the curve. So you've got to get enough uh, Zener current to be in this low resistance portion of it to get good Zener action. So you do have to be careful of that with these low voltage Zeners, and there's really no other way around it. Uh, you just have to uh, recognize the fact that you're going to have this kind of a characteristic. Let's look at an avalanche diode and see the difference. Now this diode is a 6.8 volt uh, Zener diode, but it actually operates with avalanche mode. Now in this case, with at one volt per division, I'm not gonna quite see the breakdown. So what I'm gonna do is slide this whole curve over so that my DC point is way over here, or my zero point is way over here. So now I can ex expand that scale out and look at the reverse bias characteristic more easily. And now I can actually see that very, very sharp turn to uh, avalanche breakdown. And uh, we can see that the transition from reverse bias where we're blocking to conducting is almost like turning a corner. You couldn't draw it almost any better than that. So this kind of explains why the avalanche diodes actually are a lot more stable. They appear to be more stable with varying Zener currents because you don't have that soft turn on characteristic. It actually turns on very sharp. Now to compare them uh, on the same scale and everything else, I've got the uh, curve tracer loaded up with both and I can switch back and forth between them. So here's our uh, avalanche diode and this is the true Zener diode. You can see how much softer that turn on characteristic is compared to the avalanche diode. Now something else that's interesting is that the uh, true Zener diodes, this Zener breakdown characteristic or the voltage at which we start to turn that corner has got a negative temperature coefficient. So uh, as the um, uh, temperature goes up, the, the Zener voltage will actually decrease. Uh, by contrast, the avalanche diodes have a slight positive temperature coefficient. So as the temperature goes up, this voltage will tend to increase. 
And now, as I mentioned, uh, most diodes are really a combination of both. You know, one might dominate more than the other. Uh, but manufacturers can, um, with very careful control of the processes and the doping, try to make those two um, temperature coefficients somewhat cancel out and make some pretty stable uh, Zener diodes uh, versus temperature. Now you pay more for those because they require a lot more process control, but it is something that's possible. Well, I hope this video gave you a little more background and information on Zener diodes and uh, how to use them and really what the two different types are, even though they're all called Zener diodes generally. If you like what you see, you know, please give me a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so. And thanks again as always for watching.